uh, starting off there, Gary, like I've <laughs> I've followed your stuff for so long, and I think you probably remember me as one of hopefully not many, but definitely somebody would have hounded you in the DMs with loads of questions about all things health and fitness for 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 money a time and back in the the triage militia and all that kind of thing. But you've been in the fitness industry now for like nigh on a decade, and in that way, I know it's maybe hard to like think back, but what made you want to begin in the fitness industry in the first place, and how did that sort of come to pass? Yeah, so I, I firstly, yes, I, I do remember you. I noticed names over the years, you know, when you begin to develop what you might call parasocial relationships with people that you that you chat to online. Um, but yeah, no, always, always very polite and courteous and great questions. So uh, glad to be here. And and regarding the the fitness industry, I didn't initially intend to get into fitness as such. I initially got into fitness because it was a requirement in transition year in school. Like you had to do like for the Gashka award, you have to do something that's like physical activity related. And as part of that, I decided, and this will tell you how much I've changed as a person, I'd say is I decided to join the gym because if we joined a gym, we could just say that we did the exercise or the activity, but we wouldn't actually have to show up to a club each week. <laughs> but it just so turned out that I actually really liked the gym. so kept going, decided then to change my preferences for from leaving cert from uh, aeronautical engineering and all these engineering options that I wanted to do to uh, sports science, which was kind of advised, but kind of not advised because what's a sports scientist? And I said, no, I just want to do it. I want to do sports and exercise science. So I started that process and then began to realize that, you know, I actually love this. I really, really like this. Um, but I don't think I necessarily need to do a degree in it uh, to get what I want out of it. So I decided after the first year of sports science, once I passed my exams and everything, to do a, a, a transfer to physiotherapy. And then I ended up on that pathway of, of physiotherapy and, and the rest is history. But it, amidst that period of time, through my own uh, training and interest in fitness, began coaching some other people, began sharing content online, always enjoyed just posting what I was doing, what I was doing in the gym, explaining what I was doing. And that evolved then over time to, you know, doing what I do in terms of sharing advice about training, nutrition, lifestyle, and so on. I think you've always had an interesting flavor there in terms of the stuff that you've produced in that your like mentality, I didn't, I, I wouldn't say necessarily it's like extreme in this sort of bad way, but like when you do things, you seem to, to do them very well. And I even remember some of the, the YouTube videos you've been posting in UL of all places, like, um, you know, like these, like they're, I think in a, in a way kind of, if you know, you know, kind of videos. Um, but with that, did you, do you think like from there, you almost kind of attracted a different flavor of audience in a way where they're kind of some people who maybe wanted really high level information who wanted like a really, I suppose like, it's well like kind of bulletproof mentality, which sort of came to be like a couple of years later, like, you know, you know, with the, with the following that you've grown, I think, do you, do you have still kind of like a cult following from even like the early days of when you were, when you were posting from then? Yeah, I would say so. And it actually leaves me in a weird position where I don't even know what to post when I'm posting because, you know, you'll be aware of what the modern social media landscape is like. And part of it is that you have to play the game. Things have to be of high production quality or really funny. They have to be short and sweet. There have to be props. There's all these sorts of things that you have to do in order for someone to digest the information that you're giving them. And a lot of the advice is, you know, you want to produce content at a fifth grade reading level and all this type of thing. But I like <laughs> atherosclerosis and lipids and <laughs> muscle metabolism and all these types of things that of course you can make it digestible. But there's also part of me that's like, I want to talk about what I like and what I want to share, you know? So I'm always stuck in that bit of a, an awkward position where I probably regret uh, both for me and for triage, the, the business, not maybe doubling down on a longer term platform or longer form platform earlier. Like for example, having a YouTube channel that produces videos, maybe more like Derek more plates, more dates or something like that, where it's long form content, uh, because we've always been kind of more so front facing on Instagram, but you're left in a position then where you're catering for a short form audience, trying to deliver this kind of long form content. And I've struggled more with that in recent years, earlier on when you probably initially would have followed me, I was doing like Snapchat stories 
um, and Instagram stories where I would literally probably post like 50 times a day and people would watch them <laughs> and people would uh, continue asking questions and they'd ask me questions in the DMs and it was great. And that was how I initially built that, that kind of following. But things are very different now. If you post that many stories, you look at the engagement that you get and it's just horrific. It just drops off massively. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a weird time to be using social media, I think. Yeah. I think I'd heard you say on something before that there is, I think you were saying this actually more so towards coaching of, let's say the kind of typical advice that you maybe see from the, like uh, almost like Phil Graham, Mark Cole's kind of side of the world is niche down and do this, that, and the other, but you enjoying working with different kinds of clients. It was sort of like, there's what works and there is what you enjoy. And that's sort of the, the dichotomy, you know, in a sense, even and coaching wise it's a difficult thing to do. And like you give the example there of like the business advice, like, you know, we've, we've, we've sought advice from, from Phil Graham and he's excellent at what he does. And lots of these business mentors are excellent at what they do. Um, and, and you know, they'll help you find that middle ground. But as you say, the vast majority of the advice that you'll get from kind of so-called business gurus is niche down early, focus on a very specific segment. But like, if you follow me, like, it's I, like, I'm, I'm not good at that. One day I'm in the mountains and the next time in jujitsu and the next time, you know, in the gym, being a gym bro, <laughs> the next time I'm studying or something like I'm not a, I'm not a niche down person. I, I get obsessive about things that I like and I like to do a lot of things. And that's not the best way of, of doing uh, those things, but it's also probably not the best way of posting on social media, but, but look, it's, it's just, it's just where I'm at. I feel like you even mentioning YouTube there of doing that more Derek, more plates, more date style content. I feel like that would suit you down to the ground in many respects. I think that's something where as well, it's not like the, it's not the biggest lift for you now with the level of knowledge that you've amassed to be able to do so. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't see many potential hiccups in you kind of carving that out. Cause I think there would be a demand for someone to kind of jump in with a lot of the, the, the more, uh, ancestral advice that we would kind of see now and just kind of come in with with uh, with takes that are actually more rooted in in evidence i suppose as a counterbalance maybe potentially yeah i feel like this is actually a valuable venting session to be sharing this with you because you followed me and you, and you know the game and it's interesting to get your insight but but yeah i, I think i think you are you are right there and, and that's kind of one of the things we've discussed at triage ahead of 2024 is we are going to do more youtube content but you know at the same time, it, the modern, you know, YouTube landscape, again, you have to have like, at least in most cases, you have to have the perfect thumbnail, you have to the perfect title, things have to be like script written in advance. So there's actually a hell of a lot of work that goes into it. So that's what we're trying to find at the moment is that sweet spot where we can, you know, script write and make things really presentable, but still give that long form uh, content. And I think, to be honest, YouTube's probably the way for that at the moment, because some of those sometimes on Instagram or TikTok, doing a debunking video, like there's this, you've probably heard of Brandolini's law where the, the, the amount of work that, you know, is required to debunk bullshit is disproportionately uh, greater than that required to espouse the bullshit in the first place. So someone makes a 15 second video about, I don't know how, let's say seed oils are killing you. And then you have to do, make a 15 minute video in response to explain why all these claims are incorrect and here's the evidence <laughs> it's difficult to do on a 10 second uh, attention span massively yeah i mean you see that in so many so many disciplines even like historical narratives and that kind of yeah. thing for people people who successfully challenged those in the past like it's it's a lot easier to kind of go with the flow with general consensus i mean with with triage as well so you were coaching people solo i suppose like in in the beginning you when when you began a big inflection point, I'm sure, massively would have been meeting uh, Paddy Farrell, Lord Farrell. So some yeah. may say, um, I'd be very interested to hear how you two met, and then also decided, fuck, we could probably we're a pretty good, pretty good duo here, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so me and Paddy first met on um, a Facebook forum at the time. It was uh, Irish Fit Fam back in the days when like Facebook groups were were thriving. There was an Irish Fit Fam page and people would, would post and they'd ask questions and all this. And I remember we were, I was in the comments section and I would argue with people all the time because at the time, like I was this, I was probably like a, you know, 21 year old kind of know it all and probably a little bit arrogant and wasn't very humble because I had been to college and I knew these things, whatever. So 
but, but at the same time, I was arguing things that I felt were correct against kind of more bro bodybuilders who were talking about cardio. And basically the topic of interest on this day was me and Patty were both explaining, you know, neat non-exercise activity thermogenesis and the importance of tracking steps before you focus just on cardio and all this type of thing. Um, and that that's like par for the course these days. Everyone talks about neat these days, but back then no, no one was tracking that. No one was going on about it. So we had both been making this point. And then I was like, oh, look, another guy that shared a PubMed link. Uh, that's cool. So that was our first, I think, official interaction. And then we had, you know, mutual friends uh, in Larry Doyle and a few other people in Dublin. And we just kind of, you know, hit it off from there. Our bo- We both had solo businesses that were going in the same direction, the same with Larry at the time, who was there at the start of triage. Um, we all were kind of working on the same thing. And now it's a ca- case of just doing that collaboratively with other coaches under under me and Paddy as well, um, which which has been fantastic. They've all been, you know, excellent assets, you know, and uh, and yeah, that's 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 how things have went. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, did you kind of clock as well early that you were like yeah back, back then like you're talking about things way before other people were like not like niche yeah no one's talking about that at the time many things many more things people people wouldn't have spoken about at the time did you kind of say okay here would be roughly like where we would be in the market like here is roughly like we think we can do something quite unique here that will be kind of more 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 uh, i suppose evidence-based like with what we're doing we're going to be able to we're going to be able our system is going to kind of be be adaptable enough to where we can kind of adapt around any sort of trainee um i'd be i'd be interested to hear like what the genesis where you're like okay here's where i think we'll kind of sit here a, li- a little bit more yeah that that was kind of the goal at the time was just to be deliver content towards you know people that were interested probably a little bit more in the kind of physique side of things at that time because that's just what we were more interested in at the time but also with the health focus that was kind of a something we were both interested in from the start and doing that with just this clear science base and trying to deliver the science and make it understandable and stuff. And that, that wasn't quite as popular at the time. Um, definitely a lot more popular now. There's plenty of people doing a fantastic job at that now. Uh, but that's kind of where we, we thought we would position ourselves and that's the path we uh, ended up going down. And we tried to stay true to that. I think we're actually still very similar in terms of, the way that we tried to deliver content as we were when we started the business almost eight years ago now. Um, it's always been really that that emphasis of just science-based content that's sensible, but still not you know lacking on detail, not, not trying to be what I would say is like a, a health populist where you're just <laughs> trying to reduce things down to one sentence and, and, and missing out on all the nuance. That's, that's what you, you get tempted towards, but what we've tried to shy away from yeah it's tempting as well because they're like you have like i i often think about this right with with influencers getting completely kind of skewed by an algorithm let's say and like not even intentionally not like it's not like they're kind of almost crack crazed individuals who are like oh give me give me some of those give me some of those likes but it's more just over time this like casual drift of where Christ, when I kind of remove the nuance from this a little bit here, it seems to do a little bit better and like maybe some negative comments come in and then that drives up my engagement and then like more people come in. And it's not even this conscious thing of this is somewhat, this is a so much more shady way to act. I am going to do this to get more engagement. It's just noticing, oh, that gets me a bit more engagement. It's not, it's not that bad. You know, it's not that bad if I post like that. And then it's sort of this like Churchillian drift kind of thing, like uh, except for, 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 for creating content. It's very yeah. tempting, I would say. It's and that's an excellent point. I really like that point about about the casual drift because, like, it it is very tempting. It, it kind of captures you. Like I remember last year, I made I made a video, and it's not that I disagree with this video now. It's just that I would need to make it ten times longer to get my point across. It was this this girl who had posted a video about how food is medicine, and she doesn't need medicine because she eats this kind of way and stuff. And I made a video that was like ninety second response, you know, saying this, that, and the other. But like that, I was kind. Of, it was kind of single sentence claims that I was making. But that in the comments there was lots of negative response, and the video did really well. Probably one of the, my my best videos of the year. But at the same time, I could see the temptation then for me to maybe even simplify what I was saying more, so I could get more of a negative reaction and maybe mislead a little bit. And I kind of I've kind of pulled myself up on that and said you know is that how you want to produce content and i'm just i'm just not so sure um i have friends who've managed to 
to stay away from that. Like you might be familiar with Alan Flanagan, uh, Alien and Nutrition. Like he basically barely posts on social media now and just write these super intense long form pieces of content on his website and then on in the form of a podcast with Sigma Nutrition. And, you know, that's an example of someone doing that really well. But, you know, starting from scratch and trying to do that can just be incredibly difficult. So I, I do empathize with people that end up doing the kind of clickbait soundbite stuff, but it's definitely something I try to resist. I like that a lot. I, I find it interesting as well of how the that's someone saying, you know, food is medicine and stuff like that. And I'd seen someone, I don't know, is it some was it someone on uh was it someone on instagram and just because i'd seen your handle as dr gary mcgowan of course you're a medical doctor as well yeah. this they'd looked at you, you look, I, I think they completely overlooked the fact that you've been a coach for 10 years or even a bit over 10 years and like prescribe prescribe med or like as prescribe exercise mo, mo, it's probably the biggest prescription you, you've you've like you've you've made to anyone or most common rather and they were like, you were, what, what was, what was the kind of, it was like, you were basically a drug dealer or so, something like yeah, this. It was something along the lines of, uh, you're just, what would you know about diet or you're just a glorified, you know, drug, drug dealer or something like that because of you, that you just prescribed medicines. And, and the ironic thing, as you say, is that at the time I had technically never prescribed a medicine, <laughs> um, but I had spent 10 years prescribing nutrition and exercise. And that's, that's actually at the core of my identity. So yeah, it's, it's funny. I mean, what would you make in the space now of this? Right. So there's, I'm, I'm always, I'm always careful to say that this is generally what's happening online because I think the internet is like a series of echo chambers. So I think yeah. it's like, you see one echo chamber and you see how they react, but there is certainly that sort of, um, what would you call it? The ancestral echo chamber almost of, you know, uh, just natural living, just sun, salt water. And great, it, to be fair, I, it, good advice in, in many respects. But when taken to the nth degree, it's like, you know, let's say just like putting, I, I would say like someone, a friend of mine, when I was get, getting on Roaccutane, he was telling me, oh, just use beef tallow for your face to cure your skin. I'm like, bro, I don't, I, I don't think beef tallow is going to be as effective as yeah. this, but this is just kind of some of the advice that would be spouted. Do you feel like, do you feel almost sometimes a little bit of like general negativity almost towards doctors? Cause I've, I've maybe noticed this on some accounts online and I'm like, what is going on here? Yes. And, and your point about the echo chambers and the internet being, not a general thing, but a series of echo chambers is excellent. And I would just take it to one further level, which is that they're like individual echo chambers, but they're more like kind of Venn diagrams where there's a little bit of an intersection between these different echo chambers. And this is what makes it really difficult for people to navigate because for example, you might be, let's say an outdoors person that's really into nutrition and maybe you're, you're kind of into the environment and you don't like the urban world and all those things are kind of within your chamber, let's say, but then you come across this ancestral living and there might be about 50% of the things that you actually agree with. Like we should get outdoors more. We should be active. You know, we shouldn't, um, I don't know, just eat crap diets, but then it's like these things that are kind of just shoved in with that, which is, Oh, so don't vaccinate your children. So don't take any medications if you're sick. <laughs> and I was like, oh, <laughs> you know, I, I was with you <laughs> until that part. And this is the difficult thing for people. And that's how they kind of get sucked in is because you were in the intersection of the Venn diagram and then you got dragged into the center of the echo chamber. And that's what can be really difficult for people. And I would agree with you that there is that general, I think, sentiment of being anti-medicine that has probably proliferated even more in the kind of post COVID era. Um, partially I would say for good reason, cause I like to play, you know, devil's advocate and understand where people are coming from. And I think that, you know, there was issues with, uh, maybe communication about, uh, why certain pandemic responses were occurring and there was certain overreach in some areas. I'm with people on that. But what I don't agree with is that, okay, they're like government mistakes therefore the whole institution of medicine is bad and therefore the whole practice of vaccination is bad like that's that for me is just total overcorrection and it's part of this kind of soundbite culture where you have to take your whole worldview and just bring it down to a sentence or a couple of sentences and stick with that as a rigid ideology i think that's a very poor way to live in a complex world and you just can't live like that very interesting yeah and i would 
completely echo that sentiment where you know there i suppose i've I've no medical background nothing like that just disclaimer for me making this point but it's like you know i suppose there just from you know i do have somewhat of a knowledge in like calculating risk and that kind of thing just from like previous like things i used to do before my career path now but the correct thing to do in a case like that right so you think like this crisis is going on happens very quickly the correct thing to do is to overreact and like that sounds like an oxymoron because how can you correctly overreact but it's like there's like this there's this long tail of it it's there's an exponential factor to it and like this non-linearity so like that's like in defense of like i would have gripes as well but like in defense of let's say government authorities i'm like when you don't know what's going on in something that is non-linear you are you you want to overreact um so much and with I, i'm in, i'm interested there where you said you you would have had some issues you know in those times or just with not necessarily just in those times but let's say just with let's say certain way certain things in the medical profession you come at it from an interesting perspective because you're also a physiotherapist and you have 10 years of coaching do you do you think that'll do you think that helps you a lot as a doctor where you can kind of come at things from a different perspective like you're going to you know maybe would it would it make you more uh more of like a general health prescriptive kind of individual if that if that kind of makes sense or do you think that background will be something kind of very beneficial that maybe some doctors could potentially be missing out on i would say so and and what i would say more so to give doctors some credit in this sense is that with me having that kind of decade of experience specifically with behavior change um there's an element there's this there's skill set and knowledge there together that would enable me to be able to help someone to change their diet or to maybe to to get exercising and to tell them specifically what that looks like that a, a doctor most doctors generally aren't going to have because of the amount of other things they have to learn like the intensity of medical school like it can't be overstated it is really difficult and so is postgraduate training thereafter and doctors are incredibly busy in the especially in modern hospitals where there's so many bureaucratic steps that they have to take for everything to happen um all those things make it very understandable that a doctor isn't going home at night for their one free hour and reading you know evidence-based exercise information so i understand why individual doctors uh, maybe end up with poor exercise uh, prescription skills or poor nutrition prescription skills uh, but but to your to your point i do think that my experience will definitely aid me in that uh quite a bit hopefully <laughs> and yeah and would you would you say there are any ways that we could almost reinstate that that trust a, a bit more nearly as a society i don't think i don't think in ireland we have it as much as let's say the us for example right but but we're very much a, a don't rock the boat kind of society i would say um do you know in terms of I don't think the onus is necessarily on doctors because I think there were things that were just far outside of their control in that whole time period, which is probably it's which is a time period that, that eroded trust, particularly in the US and kind of the UK. The UK seems to be a bit more 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 kind of not as much uh, less rock the boat that, 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 than we are. Um, would you see like I guess who would the onus be on to try and reinstate that trust? And are, are there any ways that we could kind of do that as a society? Because we kind of need doctors, man, and there's. A lot of stuff about the human body that we just fucking don't know. Like, well, at least someone like me didn't fucking know. Like, you need, you, like, you you need you need doctors and, and that kind of thing to to be trusted and venerated in a society for it to work very well. A hundred percent, and I think that you know, medicine is an incredibly important um, profession and, and institution. And I think that unfortunately, a lot of people don't realize that until they're sick. Um, and that's the experience I've had with trainers uh, myself who were maybe previously be quite anti-medicine or and then and then they get an illness themselves themselves and they realize you know oh these medicines they actually work and i actually improve and this is fantastic because it's very easy to delude yourself when you're healthy into thinking that oh if everyone just lived like me they'd be healthy too but then you know you end up with something that's beyond your control like some form of cancer or you end up with um i don't know uh, inflammatory bowel disease or whatever it happens to be um, and, and then you, you, you require a significant medical and or surgical intervention. So obviously you can't just get everyone to the point where they have a severe disease <laughs> to reinstate trust. <laughs> so I, I think, but to be honest with you, I think that a lot of anti-medicine sentiment 
doesn't exist in isolation and exists as part of broader anti-institutional sentiment where there's a distrust of all institutions as opposed to just medicine you know like a lot especially if you look at the kind of ancestral kind of health side of the fitness industry which often overlaps with libertarianism and to some degree conservatism but really the more libertarian people um what you typically see there is that they don't just distrust medicine they also distrust you know uh, teachers and and all politicians and uh, police and basically every kind of public institution and you know again part of that is is understandable to be fair but i don't know how you fully uh reinstate that trust as such because i think the problem to date and i'll just focus on health because that's what i know more about is that what we often tend to do um is double down when people distrust so for example um telling people that they're stupid because they didn't they were worried about their child getting vaccinated and of course i'm not saying doctors individually do that but there's often that sentiment you know that anti-vaxxers are inherently stupid uh, Mm -hmm. and not addressing uh concerns appropriately that does happen um so yeah i think dialogue is often a good way to approach conflict resolution uh treating people with with respect you know if people let's say are against masks not to just tell them they're killing their granny but rather to maybe try to have a more coherent conversation but i also understand that sometimes that's not possible sometimes people are just very ideologically opposed to medicine and to interventions and that's that's almost their worldview full stop you know which i don't know how to fix <laughs> I, I think i think the silver lining with medicine is that there's way more of an objective element to it than those other kind of fields that we kind of discuss where people might have distrust so i think that's probably a silver lining where like let's say yeah if you're in the case if you're in that that scenario where you have cancer you don't want someone telling you to like drink bone broth and ivermectin and like black seed oil just because the quran said that black seed oil cures everything except death which it actually does say you know and i've, I've said yeah i didn't I've, actually know that a friend, a friend of mine who, who i who i, I loved a bit so a load of time for him but he, he was saying that to me when i got covid there like two years i just had it last week as well but i had it like two years ago and i was like Bro, it's not what I need to hear right now. Like, but, but I think I think medicine has that element to it of, um, you know, we, you 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 would want to you would want to go to a doctor and you would want to have like chemotherapy or you want to have whatever they whatever they suggest rather than someone telling you to just have black seed oil for for argument's sake. So, I think that's the the element of it. But I can tell there as well. There's like there's always this like empath- empathetic kind of tone with like doctors that I know and a, a, a buddy of mine who was actually in um in medicine with yourself in Cork um you know as well like have this very empathetic tone like kind of the thing and that's like that's the part that makes that annoying because like doctors actually are just generally salt to the earth who just want to help and then when people are like oh I don't trust doctors it's like uh oh, bro but um in my class who are you talking about uh Sam Rast yeah I think he's in your oh, class oh Sam yeah oh yeah brilliant <laughs> yeah great great egg shout out to schmitty um but but, um but for for you then like that empathetic that seems to be why you got got into medicine as well i mean you had a flourishing you have a flourishing business you're already a physiotherapist do you know that's interesting decision to get into medicine in the first place yeah it's a weird one um i really love it i i've actually to be honest i ended up really surprised at how much i love medicine it's a really weird one um i i I thought i had concerns going in um, and this is something i kind of reviewed in my own head recently because when i was sometimes you know when you're asked a question over and over again you kind of have these like answers that you just kind of throw out there and you say the same thing and it's like yeah this is why i did medicine you know a lot of people will say like oh i did medicine because i love to help people and blah 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 and it's you know they haven't really thought it through so what i did recently was i sat down and, and i looked through my documents because I, I remember before I did medicine, I sent Patty a document. Patty's the other co-owner of Triage, basically outlining, right, here's why I want to do medicine. And I first did this for myself. Here's why I do want to do medicine. Here are the, the pros, here are the cons. Here's what the commitment will require. Here's the outcome. Okay, And I sent that to him and I reviewed it myself. And it's actually pretty much been consistent. My initial perspective was, one, I suppose to, to kind of touch on the, the ego or personal aspect is there's definitely there definitely was part of it of, that was just 
kind of self-actualization that I began to realize later post school that, do you know what? I'm actually a little bit smart and I might be able to do this. Um, whereas I didn't really think of myself in that sense when I was in school. I didn't have that like smart person identity. You know, it was the classic parent teacher meeting like Gary is not living up to his potential, blah, blah, blah. And, and that kind of, I think, went to the back of my mind and probably ate or still eats away at me a little bit. And as a result, I just kind of started working really hard with them when I was in university and, and getting really good grades. So then I thought, do you know what? Maybe medicine is something that I could do. And it also kind of, there was the business aspect to it, of course, having a doctor on a health and fitness uh, business as part at the face of a health and fitness business. It's a clearly a... Um, uh, you know, lends credibility to it and people trust you more whether or not they should, they just do. Um, I also was just incredibly interested in furthering my knowledge of physiology and anatomy and medicine generally and disease. And that was something that, that began to come to the fore during physiotherapy in particular, because I had never thought of healthcare um, and physio gave me exposure to hospitals and how doctors work and the nature of disease and it just made me very, very interested in all of that. So they were kind of all the main motivations that pushed me in there. Um, and yeah, there is that definitely that strong component of, I actually really like people. I know some people don't like people, but I really like people. Um, I like meeting people when they're vulnerable and being able to help. I think that's a great feeling, uh, both in terms of the internal feeling one gets oneself, but also I think it's inherently a good virtue. So yeah, that, that's a very strong part of it as well. So all those things came together and maybe decide, you know what, worst case scenario, maybe you don't like medicine that much and now you have doctor in front of your name, you know, best case scenario, you love it and you have plenty of options for the future. Yeah, there we go. That's kind of a nonlinear bet there, you know, asymmetric upside. Money exactly, money. it's asymmetric upside on that one. <laughs> yeah. The, see, this is, this is, I suppose, rounding off that point. That's why it's unfortunate where, like, any of my pals who are doctors, they're just such lovely, they're just such lovely people. And when you're kind of, it's unfortunate the way those last few years played out. But I do think, you know, over time, you know, hopefully people just realize, yeah, like, people get into this because generally speaking with, with medicine, people are doctors because they want to help people. And that's fundamentally, fundamentally something that they deem to be morally good and something that they would like to devote their lives to. It's not yeah. like... They're not out to get you, bro. They're definitely not out to get you. But, uh, yeah. And in, in, that, in that same sense, you know, I, I don't like to be the, the guy that's like, you know, all doctors and the whole institution of medicine and pharma is perfect either. And I think this is one of the things that people don't realize is that like doctors among doctors and between medicine and pharma, there's conflict there all the time about what's right, about what's wrong, about own, their own internal problems in terms of the health system and in terms of decisions and like that's always going on. Whereas I think sometimes that kind of public narrative is that there's this homogenous collection of people that are doctors. They get paid by big pharma. So they want to give you drugs. And it just couldn't, it's just, it's just so far from that when you actually see it on the ground. Gas. That's gas. Um, switching gears a little bit, but it kind of still not topic of, of, of the, the, the online space. There are a couple of ways that I have definitely been codded, let's say, in the past by like different advice um, to the point where I actually went vegan for like two and a half years. Um, not that if anyone's like vegan listening, if, like I think like power to you and all the rest of it, but like definitely not uh, the optimal diet if you want to like build muscle or be like a really good rower like I wanted to when I was back at school and that kind of thing. But I, you do a really good job, I think, of dispelling some of these some of these kind of uh, i suppose more nonsensical points that people can bring up so do you know you have uh, kind of this element of like naturalistic fallacy that some people would would promote let's say in the ancestral diet space where they say our ancestors ate x therefore x is optimal for health how is that kind of not quite 100 percent true the, even though because that, that that caught at me completely i was like oh yeah of course that makes complete sense yeah and it, it does make complete sense like that's that's something that sounds really logical it's like okay if humans evolved for so many hundreds of thousands millions of years 
and we ate this food all along, wouldn't it be a good idea to keep eating what we ate sooner? And now this is firstly, before you get to disagreement about what humans actually ate, which there's no shortage of, okay? Let's assume we know what humans ate back in the day. Um, the, the, the thing about evolution is that you're optimized for reproductive success, not longevity. And this is an absolutely key point because there's technically nothing from the, if you were to anthropomorphize evolution as a person, there's nothing from evolution's perspective that would make you want to live to a hundred, you know, that you can make some maybe evolutionary psych uh, arguments or social arguments about having a, a grandparent or whatever. But the primary driver in terms of reproduction is that the, what you, what, what will be selected for are traits that lead to the passing down of your genes, selective reprodu uh, reproduction and proliferation of the species. That's the primary thing that is being uh, selected for. Um, so as a result, you know, you get selection for traits that are going to confer reproductive success uh, and behaviors that are going to confer reproductive success. So the diet, let's, let's say that, let's just assume that our ancestors only made ate ribeyes and butter. They didn't, but let's go with that. Okay. In that case, um, there's no, there's not necessarily a massive like reproductive disadvantage with that diet but there might be a longevity disadvantage. For example, if someone has elevated LDL cholesterol for many, many years, or they have an increased risk of bowel cancer, let's just use those two examples. Those two things are going to lead to disease and events and potentially death, generally between the sixth and eighth decade of life, okay? So it's actually generally in the post-reproductive period that people end up seeing the effects of those behaviors. It's not generally when they're in their reproductive age. So as a result, you can't just make arguments about what our ancestors ate and, 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 and attach that to an argument of longevity. Okay. You can, you could make an argument that this is a diet that is going to lead to reproductive success. Great. But that's a very low barrier of entry for the modern person. <laughs> you know, we're not just trying to get to 30 or 40 or 50. Most of the time people are talking about trying to optimize so that they can live and thrive into their later years. And the behaviors and, uh, you know, the, the diet or the use or lack thereof of medicine, um, they're all generally related to later decades, which are beyond uh, reproduction. So I hope that makes sense. It does make sense. What, what was what was the law as well that we'd we'd I'd forget the name where you're Candelini's law. What is it again? Brandolini's law. Brandolini's law. So you can see there with Brandolini's law, which states yeah, it that it took me like fucking five minutes to get, to get through. <laughs> took you to where whereas whereas you're hearing that you're like, are your ancestors ate this, bro? So you should eat it. You're like, yeah, yeah, definitely, hundred percent, bro. Yeah, that makes total sense. But there, Brandolini's law coming in where to refuse that it takes such an upward upward kind of upward battle there but another another one that's sort of adjacent to that is the did i did i see someone on instagram say this the brain is comprised of cholesterol i'm like is your brain just goo man is your your brain's just made of egg yolks man but it was like the but basically saying yeah like the your your keto people they're like the brain's made of cholesterol as a result you yeah. want to use fat as the as the brain's fuel source what's wrong about that one this yeah this is a funny one because it's actually one that they can say in one sentence and it genuinely takes like 15 minutes and loads of citations <laughs> to wipe out oh, no. which is so the claim the claim is just the your brain is made of cholesterol therefore if you want the powerful brain you need to have high cholesterol or you need to eat loads of cholesterol it comes in two variants <laughs> Like the reason that's incorrect is is uh, on multiple different levels. Firstly, the the level of cholesterol in one's diet and the level of cholesterol in one's blood and the level of cholesterol in one's brain or specifically within the cells are all different. Okay, they're all they're they're all different. You know, increasing um, cholesterol within the blood, let's say LDL cholesterol, does not mean that your brain somehow grows quicker or provides that cholesterol to your brain cells. The cells within the body have the ability to increase to create their own cholesterol, um, and that, that's a that's a really important point. Is that it, it's able to create its own cholesterol from non uh, cholesterol molecules. We don't actually require uh, cholesterol 
in the diet in order to uh, get or create our own cholesterol. Um, so that's that's kind of the, the the first point is we can make our own cholesterol in our cells. Uh, secondly, the cholesterol that we eat is not necessarily the cholesterol that ends up in uh, those specific cells. And then thirdly, there's a detachment between blood cholesterol and cholesterol within, again, those cells. Now, it gets messier as you talk about medication because there is actually a nuanced argument that you'd have at the end of learning all this stuff, which is if we take a very high level of some uh, statin drugs, could that potentially decrease the synthesis of cholesterol within the brain? And could that potentially lead to uh, dementia or something along those lines? They're like really nuanced arguments that like are like way beyond this conversation and are often the debate of like lipidologists and uh, people who research Alzheimer's disease and so on. Um, but it just don't, it doesn't seem like that's actually a major concern at all. But we're not even talking about medicine here. We're talking primarily about, about diet. And basically I would summarize it as there's, you do not need to try to increase your cholesterol to make your brain healthy. That's, there's no evidence for that. It's ridiculous. It's just not true. How should someone like me, uh, who is, let's say, not not an expert on any of this stuff, who is just a humble a humble lifter, a humble gym bro and jujitsu guy, how should he? How how can I arm myself against just bollocks essentially on on the internet like that? I'd love to have almost a few razors where I'm like, okay, I can just put this through through very quickly. Be like, okay, this is likely incorrect because of X Y x y z or you know how, how can i so for for someone like myself or someone who may be listening it may just be a humble lifter what could we do to make ourselves a bit more armed against just that this sort of nonsense yeah i think the first thing i always say to people and, and you're you i know you you'd be someone that's aware of this already but a lot of people don't do it is slow consumption um and what i mean by that is if you come across an idea on tiktok or instagram reels 30 seconds, 60 seconds, or 90 seconds should not be enough for you to accept a new piece of knowledge that's significantly going to change how you eat, how you train, how you live. Like maybe there might be little things like, oh, here's a tip to get more protein. Fair enough. But if it's something like groundbreaking, like you should get off medication and start eating this diet instead, that's something that should require like an extensive conversation with someone that knows this, about your specific disease, about why you're on those medications, um, about your blood work and so on. So slow consumption for me is about taking in an idea. Let's say you get it from Instagram Reels and then maybe you do a Google search or a YouTube search for something that's a little bit more long form. But you don't just stop there because what you have to realize is that if you go on YouTube, you're not necessarily getting the... Uh, consensus or the truth just by virtue of it being the most popular video. So I do encourage people, you know, to watch, you know, content from dissenting views, you know, and, and things that disagree. But then you, what you have to understand, and this is the most difficult part, is that you have to have the humility to realize that you mightn't be able to decipher between what is true and what is false. And this comes back to the difficult or the difficulty of what we mentioned previously with those examples is that it's actually very easy to make up bullshit. And just as there are 10 second videos espousing bullshit about, you know, cholesterol and heart disease, there are also one hour videos that do the same thing. Because unfortunately, there are people that will actually clearly selectively uh, present citations from PubMed from legitimate sources and will just totally misrepresent it for their own cause. There was a case of this yesterday where I, I, I retweeted it on an X, or reposted it on an X, I should say, um, which was this guy, Dr. Tro. He's one of these kind of low carb, like diet gurus. And he posted a figure from a study and the link to the study talking about how it's not a uh, saturated fat that increases LDL cholesterol. Um, it's actually BMI. And that was the type, that was basically what he tweeted out. But the graph that was right in front of me as I looked at it clearly showed that LDL cholesterol scaled with saturated fat intake as a percentage of the diet. He's right, so did BMI, but it very clearly showed it in the graph. Now, reading a graph is something that you might take for granted if you have 
a, li a little bit of health education or you remember, maybe you remember some things, but this was like a 3D graph. So it's, it, there's multiple different things going on. You mightn't even take the time to try, try and understand that. But if I see that as a consumer, I see Dr. Troll. Okay, this guy's legit. He's got a weight loss transformation in his photo. So he's not just a doctor, but he also walks the walk. This looks great. But it was total, utter nonsense what he was saying. And then when challenged again in the posts, you could see that he was responding, softening his points. Um, but the problem is most people don't go as far as that and they won't get the challenge from the maybe more evidence-based person. So I'm giving that example to show that it's really not, I, I don't have a clear answer for you as to how you as an individual can decipher between, you know, what's true and what's false. But the main thing I always say is slow consumption, particularly in cases where, as I said, there's something that seems to be really groundbreaking. Then what you do is you'd look maybe for some form of consensus. Is there a consensus? It, like if 97% of doctors agree on something, and this is clearly the main consensus, it's possible, it's certainly possible that 3% are correct, but it is very, very unlikely. And therefore, if you're basing all your decisions on the 3%, it's just a case of probability that you're likely to make very poor decisions versus the person that's so-called trusting the experts. And again, I'm not saying that trusting the experts is always the right way. There will be mistakes, there will be errors, but I think for the average Joe on the street, just taking the advice of your doctor, and maybe if you're not sure, getting a second opinion is likely to take you on the right path 95, 99% of the time, I would say. Gotcha. I think, genuinely speaking, a great a great defense against this honestly has just been following you like at least from my own perspective has been following has been following you for years for i people. can't say that you know yeah but you can't say that for for people watching dr gary mcgowan <laughs> on 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 instagram and triage method on youtube but one other thing that that has been coming up in the the culture a bit more these days which isn't so much a dietary thing and i've found this to be quite interesting and i'd love to hear your take on it is this whole craze of people saying that mouth breathing can actually have a def deforming effect on your face and that if you were i've even heard andrew huberman going on about this and there's uh, uh, just to give you full transparency i've been taping my mouth i'm putting a nasal strip on my nose as i go to sleep lately and i do feel more rested but there is evidence to say that nasal breathing does lower your resting heart rate so maybe yeah. that's pr probably the whole explanation there but what do you make of this whole idea that mouth breathing can deform one's face and that we should be nasal breathing all the time is that is that true or or is it not so much yeah i don't really have a like a i don't have a massively like passionate take on the whole mouth breathing nose breathing thing i think it's one of these like very minor variables that does have some physiological significance like you say like the resting heart rate component but is just totally overblown um and, and what, what i would say to, to your specific question is i think what's more of relevance and the reason that people make these claims with great strength is that it is true that facial morphology significantly impacts uh, how you breathe. This is most evident in like uh, anesthetics, for example, when you try to intubate someone, you'll measure different uh, aspects of their face. So for example, uh, how much they can protrude their jaw, um, like their, their teeth, how much there's an overbite or an underbite and things like that. And this becomes very relevant because you're trying to put a tube down and it's very, very difficult. You know, if someone has like a really retracted jaw and they have that classic kind of bird face, so to speak, sorry to be derogatory to anyone who has um, a, a retracted small jaw, but it, there is a, a very clear um, difference in how one breathes and the access to the airway. Um, and, and things like risk of sleep apnea and so on. So it's not without merit that facial morphology is important. What is with far less merit is the fact that as an adult, you can now change that by not breathing through your mouth. Um, I think that's a huge claim uh, that I haven't seen evidence for. Uh, and I would definitely like to see evidence for uh, if, if that is the case. It, it doesn't seem to be the case. I think that breathing is largely autonomous and largely self-selected and yes there are cases where people do need to improve their ability to breathe nasally for example if they have like a deviated septum in some cases that requires um uh, surgery uh, if they have another if they've had previous trauma to the nose that can impact their ability to breathe through the nose but i think the idea generally speaking that breathing through your mouth is 
is going to be detrimental to any significant health or performance variable is fairly unsubstantiated. Again, as I say, that's not to say that, like in your case, where you feel more rested from your breathing through your nose, I'm not saying that's not true. That can absolutely happen. And I think, I think that's great. And I have, I, I actually have at least one client who I've encouraged to use nasal strips because he, you know, struggles to breathe through his nose and he finds himself snoring a lot. And it's something that we're working on. So yeah, not a super passionate take, but I would say this is definitely an area where there is a lot of kind of uh, overconfident BS, I would say. Is it, it's almost akin in a way from what I gather there to someone saying that you can change your bicep insertions or something. Yeah, exactly. Like do this exercise to fill in this gap in your biceps when it's kind of like anatomically determined, you know, it's like maybe for some people that if they, if they hold their jaw in a, in a very rigid position, uh, instead of retracting it when they breathe, that maybe there's some change in muscularity or something, but I, I struggle. I, I think that m- most of this is people who have decent facial structure, so to speak already, they say that they breathe through their nose. And then that gains traction, you know. Yeah, I think the 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 anecdote the anecdote for me was seeing my brother breathe through his nose. I'm like, geez, he's a he's definitely the the more handsome one of the two. So I'm like, all right, I think I, I, think I got to get onto onto this nasal breathing hype. But <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's so it's so funny there where a lot of this is sort of mediating kind of the the the. Well, actually, I'll, I'll get to that. I'll get to that point in a second, but. I think kind of a, a customary point there, I've began training my neck as well. And I think I've seen right. you do it, do a bit of neck training as well. I know we both do jujitsu as well. Um, what do you, what do you make of neck training? Do you prescribe it to clients sometimes? Is it something you're a big fan of? Is there a particular, particular way one should train their neck in, in, in any way? What do you, what do you make of that as kind of a, a prescription? Yeah, I actually quite like neck training. I'm fairly pro that to be honest. Um, I, I've done a bit of neck training myself. It's something I was actually thinking today. God, I need to be a bit more consistent with that now um, to do a bit more of it. Uh, I kind of have spells where I'm consistent with it and then I stop for a few weeks and you know you know how it is. So I need to be a bit more consistent with neck training. But I do think it's productive, uh, particularly for jiu-jitsu, striking sports, rugby. Um, I think anywhere where you're taking trauma to the head uh, or you're being choked out in the neck. Um, but not even just the choking, to be honest. What I think of more so when it comes to neck training jiu-jitsu is that you end up in so many awkward positions on your neck that having extra muscle is likely to be protective against uh, injury. And I think that's something that's important. Again, this is probably one of those areas, like I classify my views as kind of being like, right, I can say this with certainty because there's, or not almost certainty, let's say, because there's loads of evidence to support it and great long-term trials and everything. These things, when it comes to training, specifically for niche things like neck training, you're not going to get great studies on that. Okay. So I can't say like, you know, that there's a clear reduction in injury risk, but there's enough kind of rationale and at least some hints from research that it's probably wise. Um, so, so yeah, I support neck training just on the breathing note as well. This is something that is important is that with, uh, things like sleep apnea risk and snoring and so on, the thicker your neck, the higher your risk of those things. Um, so this is something you particularly see in, uh, bodybuilders that have large traps um, and bodybuilders who uh, particularly take anabolic steroids because all tissues grow when you take steroids. So all these things can increase your risk of things like sleep apnea because sleep apnea is largely a mechanical issue because you're lying down, you've got all this muscle that's pushing in, and then you've got this mass that stops you from being able to breathe properly. So um, that is something to note. Now, with that said, I don't think you're going to push yourself to sleep apnea because of a few neck bridges you know it's it's yeah. powerful. it's not going to be a massive training effect but how do i recommend training it did you want to t- come in there I'd love, I'd love to hear about that yeah how yeah so how you train it um i i view the the, the neck as kind of similar to uh, many other areas of the body in that right it has muscles what do you need to do you need to put tension on those muscles how are you going to do that you're going to uh, load it load those muscles through the largest range of motion you can, you know, safely, of course. Um, so you've got a few different movements in the neck that are the primary things that you would train, which is flexion, chin down, extension, chin back. Then you've got lateral flexion to each side. So shoulder to or ear to shoulder. And then you've got rotation, which is, you know, uh, saying no. So all those things can be trained. And uh, an easy way to do it is to start with something like a, 
um, a neck harness if if you have access to one. I think they're fantastic because it stops you having to fiddle around with bands. And I've had a few times with bands where it's come off the anchor point and hit me in the face. You know, it happens, but uh, banded setups can work well if you only have bands. You know, you can train neck extension, neck flexion. What I recommend is that when people put the band around their head, you hold it with your hands as well, and then it keeps it in place. So that can work quite well. Uh, again, just using your kind of standard training principles, you know, somewhere between 10 to 20 reps to start off with, uh, specifically because when you're using a band, you're not going to do like 3RM or anything, you know. So 10 to 20 reps, nice, uh, slow control movements. Start off with just a couple of sets because you don't want like severe neck doms uh, or delayed onset muscle soreness. And then you build up from there and, and progressively overload over time. You can do that with all of those movements then. The neck harness works really well because you can begin to go much heavier than with bands. Like even if you have really strong bands, I'm just not taking that risk of the band coming back and taking my eye out. You know, it has happened people. Um, so yeah, the, the flexion and extension, really easy to train. Uh, you can also do that in like a neck bridge format. So going back on your neck from a glute bridge position, uh, you can do forward neck bridges as well. I put my head on the edge of a bench and like move into extension and flex back. And you can do similar in lateral flexion. Rotation can be a little bit more difficult to train because you, you don't often get the traction um, of the band on your head, but that, that can work if you have a, a band that sticks to your head well. Um, and there are also some neck rotation devices. I think J Joe Rogan's always on about the iron neck. I haven't used one myself, but they do seem to be pretty solid. Very, very interesting. Yeah, I've been, I've been, I've been very pro neck training the last while, even just for like for jujitsu, it really helps. But also, I mean, if you see some jujitsu guys like Buchecha, for instance, his neck is thicker than his head, and it just makes you, it just, it gives yeah. you a bit more, it gives you a bit more of that Jason Statham kind of vibe to you going around the place, which you know, you, yeah. I don't think anyone's going to say no to. Yeah, it's pretty. It is pretty aesthetic, in fairness, and especially if you're like trying to stay lean. Uh, one of the things that happens is your neck gets really lean. That's something that happened to me in the past. My neck used to be way skinnier and I just look like a child. <laughs> it's just like this tiny head on top of a very, very mildly muscular body. It just doesn't look right. <laughs> so get a big <laughs> I've I have such an enormous head as well that like I just need to I need like the written my neck needs to to be thick just for me to just for me to look somewhat normal. So just so yeah, hold for, up that head it's gonna start <laughs> literally just to hold up the watermelon on top like i remember one of my one of my buddies back in back in school like used to call me coconut head from ned's declassified school survival guide which you know shout out to coconut head what an absolute what an absolute g um i'm co coming up to the, I, I know that you've been so generous with your time but we'll come to the, the end here but i i there's think no there's like a, there's a theme here through some of the things that we've discussed which is sort of mediating some of the potential negative you kind of affects the internet could maybe have with, with the opinions that you'd be exposed to. But someone who's come up that I'd love to get your opinion on is Sam Sulak. And he's obviously taking the, the world by storm really in terms of content. But one thing I was thinking of was the generation that we're more so in. So I'm 25, I believe you're 28 or 27, sorry. 28. Uh, 28. 28, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have to make sure. But yeah. I, when I was kind of the, the phenomenon at the time for me, I just missed the Zizir. I think he died in August, 2011. So I'd have been, I would have been yeah. 12 at the time. Um, I think you would have, you would have caught that, that kind of craze a little bit, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, but mm -hmm. for me, it was Jeff's side, the second coming yeah, of Ziz. Yeah. And I was thinking about this the other day and I was like, right. So people talking about Sam Sulak, but I was like, he is almost sitting in the place that Jeff side and Ziz were in, in a respect. And I was thinking, I was like, what's a worse influence in a way where to Ziz's credit, right? So you could take the negative side of Ziz and Jeff's side and say, right, these lads are just going around to festivals, munching a load of pills in a field and just getting off their head and, and being shredded and this kind of thing. And that certainly was a factor in, in what they were doing, even if it wasn't that explicit. But in a way, you know, a lot of people weren't weren't going going and doing that. A lot of the, the, the positive side of that movement was be social, get out there, talk to people. Don't, you know, don't be don't be a sad cunt, basically was kind of the kind of the thing. But with Sam Zulek, what I kind of see, I'm like, damn, are, like, are we going to get an ever-increasing amount of young lads getting onto steroids very early? Are they kind of going to just dismiss any sort of a social life or kind of a relationship or um, or maybe seeing a bit of the world or, you know, developing other other areas of themselves? Um, you know, have you watched a lot of Sam Sulek? You know, with, have you kind of developed any sort of, you know, have you kind of learned a bit more about kind of what he's been up to and yeah, I, I guess kind of the influence that, that he's having. I mean, 
I, I wonder, like, is he this generation's kind of version of Ziz in a sense? You actually made a fascinating point there that I hadn't thought of. I thought of obviously the, is this going to influence people to go on steroids, whatever, like that. For me, that's always been around. Like, I mean, if you're into bodybuilding, like it's always going to be there. But I'll come back to that point because what you said, it was really interesting. I hadn't really thought of is the pro-social versus, versus anti-social nature. Because that's actually a really good point is that back in when I started lifting and, and when you were started lifting and getting into fitness, all the influencers were very much pro-social in nature in that, like you say, Jeff side, Ziz, um, lots of other people, even the people that were like really into bodybuilding, they were still like, I don't know, really outgoing and like Steve Cook or someone like that, for example, he was one of my idols at the time, but it was all, you know, he, he seemed to have a very integrated life, you know, whereas with someone like maybe Sam Sulik, it is very kind of more like that recluse bodybuilder archetype where I do me, that's all that matters. And all the memes I've seen kind of created in relation to his content have been like that, you know, um, it, it, like when when she says X, Y, Z and you, he just starts talking about his biceps or something and they're hilarious, of course. It's very funny from a from a from just a meme perspective, but it is that is a sentiment that I have seen quite a bit is like, you know, ignore other responsibilities, just get jacked, you know, ignore relationships, just get jacked, you know, and just, just kind of live like that. So I don't know. I'd need to let that stew for a while, I think, but that is something that's definitely interesting is that kind of, we're that lone wolf recluse mentality that maybe people will idolize that in some way, particularly maybe those guys who aren't social already, maybe instead of trying to develop those social skills and be a sick cunt, so to speak, that they just won't and they'll just uh, retreat. Um, kind of like the men going their own way, MIG, MGTOW movement type of thing. So, so yeah, that, that is, that is interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, it's something I've been thinking about a lot because I used to watch Jeff side a lot. And I would, I remember one of my, one of my friends when we were after the gym, um, he wasn't as into the gym. He was, he was more into, into hurling and football and that kind of thing. And he was coming after and he was like, Oh, I've seen that. Those is his videos. Like, I was a Muppet kind of thing. And I was like, what? No, it's his, it's his. You, you know, I was very offended by it, but then you get a kind of an outside perspective on it when you're seeing Sam Sulek and you're maybe not in the age demographic where the bulk of his audience would be. And you're kind of like, oh man, yeah, like I can kind of see different perspectives on this. And it made me think of, it made me think of, of, of all of that. But I, I think that wouldn't have had the best influence on me because I'm extroverted, but I'm like quite avoidant. Like I don't, like I'm, it's, it's like a weird, kind of a strange mix. And so there's a part of that that really appeals to me of being a recluse. Um, yeah. So I'm actually almost a bit grateful in a way that th those were a bit more of the influences because it was like, no, like go out and don't internally negotiate to get what you want from the world, like externally negotiate and go out and transact and and do your do your thing. It's sort of, it, it, in, a, in a way, Ziz and Jordan Peterson have some overlap in terms of their, their Venn diagrams in a way, which is a very strange thing to say. But there is that element of go out in, you know, with all the shortcomings that you may have, go out and give it a stab and you will be a better man for it. Everything. And that's kind of the thing that would worry me a wee bit more is just the, 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 the reclusive element of it, where it's just live in the metaverse and make your online life matter more than your actual life. It, I, I, I kind of see that. I'm like, that's frightening. That is a fantastic point, particularly in light of potentially where technology is going, you know, metaverse, etc. But but yeah, because previously people have asked me about Sam Sulek. I get asked about him all the time. But generally people just ask, like, what do you think about him bringing a more kind of bro style to lifting back and this type of thing? And I'm like, I don't care, man. It's pretty positive. Like, most people just need to lift and eat healthier, and that's fantastic, you know? Um, but yeah, that's an angle I hadn't thought of. I had thought of, obviously, the fact that he's absolutely ginormous at a very young age, and now people will want to be ginormous at a young age, which requires, obviously, lots of extra assistance. Um, but there's other positive elements to him. Like I think the fact that maybe he is kind of like a, a humble guy that isn't the most good looking. It's pro it's probably good to have those people rather than just like the Jeff sides and Steve Cooks who are clearly genetically superior to us. Um, like I think you know, I was probably thinking of those positive elements. I also think that from what I gather, he's in school or in university doing engineering and hasn't dropped out despite his fame. He's continuing to finish the degree. Um, I thought that warranted respect. I was like, yeah, I like that. That's because I know myself, even with my very small following and very small business, I know how tempting it is to just drop it all and just do your thing. Uh, so I respected that for sure. 
Um, so yeah, I think I think probably a bit of a mixed character. I don't think him himself is in any way malicious. I think he's actually seems he's like a guy and a very positive influence overall in what he's doing. But like you say, how people read into that and how they apply it to their own lives, I think that's something that could be interesting to observe. Yeah, no, and and I like that just to to round that off in a sense where like I I actually love watching him. I think he's I think he's an absolute legend, and I think he's I only really... see the sh- I only see the short clips, so I don't really know that much about him. But they're the bits I've seen, and it's it's after right. like he's just got a pretty it's, funny sense of humor. Like it's literally like just being a fly on the wall with one of the boys, really. Yes. And just it's literally it's almost like those old David Laid blogs where he's going around with his two mates, like Dylan and Quinn, except you are just, you, you are, it's like, it's like just you and Sam kind of on the yeah, thing. Yeah. And he's a bit more, he's a bit more awkward, but in a very lovable way. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's the point around, around off, I suppose. But I think that influence will be, will be interesting to see play out. But yeah, Gary, I suppose final, final thing rounding off, like, you know, where should people go to kind of find out a bit more about what you do, all your channels and, and coaching, which of course, like we are saying with, with with me getting uh influenced by things online like your your channel has been almost a bit of a shield to that or your instagram massively has been a bit of a shield to that for me over the years like massively so i i highly vouch for anyone listening here like definitely definitely go and, and, and follow what what you're the, the the place you're about to you're about to state before i interrupted thank you very much cheers um yeah so look you can follow me at dr gary mcgowan on instagram you'll find all other things from there at triage method on instagram as well triage method on youtube www.triagemethod.com we do offer coaching as i said that's from myself and from the other coaches on the team and um, so we coach a fairly broad range of people to be honest like we said at the start of the conversation we didn't want to niche down so what did we do we got people that had different skill sets and as a result we can help more people so that's what we do we help people with body composition with performance with injury rehab the relationship with food all sorts of things so if you're interested you can drop me a message or you'll find that the information on our website. Similarly, we have a nutrition course as well, which we're relaunching in two weeks time. And that's for people who maybe they're trainers already and they want to add on a nutrition qualification to start taking that practice more seriously, or people who maybe are just interested and they want to now take things uh, to the level where they can actually coach others in nutrition. So that's pretty much pretty much everything that uh, that we put out there. Perfect. And just recapping for anyone listening, this episode will be out by the time that nutrition course is live. So you can just go to triagemethod.com or go to Dr. Gary McGowan on Instagram. Highly recommend. So check it out. Gary, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you.